Hello, my name is Chris Hawthorne and I'm a member of the St Anne's Church Ministry Team here in Chasetown. This is our last session of looking at the resurrection stories found in the Gospels and in the Book of Acts. This week's reading comes from the second chapter of Acts, reading verses 29 to 47. Fellow Israelites, I can, can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised Jesus to life, and we are witnesses of it. We are all witnesses. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet... He said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, all of whom the Lord God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves. From this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptised and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Most children know what the word arachnophobia means and if they don't many of them understand the whole concept in a different way. They don't like spiders, they're afraid of them. And this suffix, this word ending, phobia, is another well-known term of use that we all tend to use. But I wonder, I wonder whether you know what glossophobia means. Apparently, it's always on the top 10 list of commonly held phobias, and it's often in the top five, and for many people, it is their number one phobia. It even beats thanatophobia. Thanatophobia is a fear of dying. Glossophobia is a fear of speaking in public. Well, I suppose there are a number of reasons why people might have this particular phobia, this fear, embarrassment the possibility of being laughed at, or criticised, or humiliated, as well as the fear of what to do if you dry up or you lose your place on the script. In today's reading, Peter speaks to thousands of people. Peter. Peter, the man who was humiliated and tormented because he denied Jesus three times. And that had only happened maybe a month, six weeks earlier. Peter, who was asked three times by Jesus, Peter, do you love me? And yet he speaks without any notes. This man does not suffer from glossophobia because he's filled with the Holy Spirit and guided by this Spirit to speak God's truth. 
Does it work? Is he successful? Well, verse 41 says, those who accepted his message were baptised and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So I think we can say, yeah, he was successful. However, more importantly, Peter is open and honest, brutally honest to his audience. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Peter is telling the Jews that the one person Jews have been waiting for, God's chosen one, who will redeem Israel, has been and gone. They missed it. Worse still, they didn't just blink and then realise he'd passed by. They'd heard him and rejected him. And then even worse than that, they crucified him. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? When you mess up big time, it's hard to know what to do. You can deny it, deny that you did anything wrong, but that's pretty stupid because you know you're lying to yourself and to others. And you can sweep it under the carpet and that just delays things and they fester. And you can apolo apologise and hope that that's enough. But Peter offers a deeper, fuller route, which is life-changing. Repent and be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. These two acts are the start of our Christian journey. We repent, which means that we admit to God that we have done wrong and so deserve his judgment, and then we are baptised. Baptism is an event which allows the Holy Spirit to cleanse and refresh us. We do not have the rushing wind at baptism, nor is the person who is baptised visited with a tongue of fire over his or her head. The Holy Spirit does not always arrive in such dramatic form. But this inpouring fills us with hope and purpose. Earlier in that chapter in Acts, Peter quoted from the prophet Joel, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prosify. Pros prosify. Your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. This term, the last days, simply means that period of time between Jesus' death, his resurrection and then his return in glory. So we are living in the last days. And I'm sure Peter had no thought that it was going to be over 2,000 plus years away. But more important than the timing is the breadth of Joel's vision. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. There's no suggestion that God's Messiah is just for men. Nor is there any suggestion that it's only men who will be used by God to spread the word. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. So there's no age restriction. The young will have visions. The old will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. So there's no class distinction here. Both male and female servants will receive the Holy Spirit God's love, God's mercy and God's forgiveness. God's plans for the past, the present and the future include everyone. Remember, for the rich, a servant often meant having a slave and the slaves were virtually always Gentiles, i.e. they were not Jews. The point of that is that Jesus is here for everybody. It's all-encompassing. 
And then this passage ends with a beautiful description of a community of followers who break bread together regularly and who live together seeking to help and support the poor and the needy. There is no philophobia in this community, no fear of love. Rather, they are bold, selfless and courageous because God's spirit is there helping them to focus on God's purposes to grow his kingdom, which is based on mercy, forgiveness, truth and love. A prayer. Merciful and loving Lord, help us to seek and receive your spirit in our lives so that our relationships may be blessed and enriching. Amen.